I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to Hope Free Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit on our Good Friday afternoon service and a Friday that we reflect upon just the darkness of sin that has affected our lives and separated us from God, but in that also celebrating God's goodness for us through his son, Jesus. So let's start off in a word of prayer, if you'd please join me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are here today, Lord, with hearts filled with sorrow for the sin that has so affected our lives and has so separated us from you. But God, we are here to worship today your goodness, the goodness that you have shown to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to die upon the cross to save us from our sins. Let your Holy Spirit fill our hearts with the knowledge and understanding of the healing power that comes from the cross and Christ's blood on the cross. Lord, to strengthen our faith in you, to strengthen our assurances that you have promised the forgiveness of sins to all who place their faith and hope in your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds my the chosen one bring many sons to It is nothing that we have done. It is everything that he has done for us. But it's because of what he has done for us that we can go before him then relying on his work for us on the cross and confessing to him our sins. So friends, I would invite you now to join along with me as we go before our Lord together confessing to him our sins. O Christ, Lamb of God, slain for the sin of the whole world, with penitent heart, I come to your cross, pleading for mercy and forgiveness. My sins, and they are many, have added to the burden of your suffering, 
and have nailed you to the accursed tree. For me, thou hast tasted the agony of utter darkness, that I might not perish, but have everlasting life. Have mercy upon me, O Christ, Lamb of God. Embrace me with your love, and forgive me all my sins. Thy death brings healing to my soul, peace to my mind, cleansing to my heart. If you would mark iniquity, I could not come. For my hands are unclean, my lips are sullied, and my heart is blackened by sin. But beholding you, bleeding, despised, forsaken, dying, pierced, I come to be cleansed and forgiven. O Christ, Lamb of God, grant that I may daily walk by faith, crucifying all sinful desires, and giving myself and dedicating my all to you. Keep me faithful to the end of my days until I stand before your throne to worship you, the Lamb once slain, but now living and reigning forever, adored by the multitude of heaven. Hear my cry, Redeemer of my soul. Amen. is the 
Friends, please rise for our scripture readings. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This ends our scripture reading. You may be seated. Sir. 
I want you to bow your heads to me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, may we always be in awe of you. May we always be in awe of your greatness, of your goodness, of your love, your grace, your mercy. Father, all the good things that you have done for us. Not because we are good, but because you are good. Thank you, Father, for the promise then today of the forgiveness of sins given to us by your Son, Jesus, because you are good. May we celebrate in that always. Amen. And so here we are this afternoon, and it's a celebration, if you want to call it that, on our Christian calendar, a day that we like to call Good Friday. But, but some of us struggle to call a day like today good. You know, we have the sanctuary dark, we, we, we're, we come in and we exit kind of quietly, that somber reflection on our sinfulness, and it's, it's hard to think of a day like this as being good, but it was a day that was good for mankind because it was today that God's goodness was revealed for us on the cross. And it doesn't change the fact, though, that what makes this day heavy is the fact that God's goodness came to us in Jesus, and yet we hung him up on the cross. But even though we reject God's goodness, even though we maybe struggle to understand it, I think it's important that we talk about God's goodness. That maybe we can understand it. That maybe we can see what God's goodness looks like. And that's what I want to do this afternoon. I want to focus today on God's goodness. To use this Good Friday to understand why God is good. Because, you know, sometimes with the mess this world is in, sometimes it's, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there is good because God created it to be good. Or if anything, we diminish how good things are because we ourselves diminish how really good can be. And so what happens is then we try to place our definition of good and it really just greatly minimizes how really good God is. For example, I went online, I was just curious, I'm like, what is good? First thing that pops up is this, this article on Oprah's website titled, Five Ways to Be the Kindest, Gentlest You. And honestly, it's a nice list. First on the list, reserve judgment to others. You know, you can't always be right. That's fitting. The second thing was give people a chance to talk. The third thing was be honest with all people. Share with them honestly. The fourth one, being selfless. In essence, be aware of your actions and how they can affect others. The fifth thing on our list, to see the good in others. I mean, again, these are really nice traits on a list like that. That's probably a pretty pleasant person to be with. But if we apply those standards to God and measure God's goodness just based on that, we're completely diminishing how truly good God is. God is much more than just simply a pleasant person to be with. And what's even more amazing about God's goodness is you've got to realize this is the God of the universe, and he's good. He's God. He can be whatever he wants, but he's good. Because that's just who he is. And when we understand how good he is, we can understand the, how deep of a level that gets. It's a level that we can't even begin to comprehend, but let's go to scripture today to really understand how good God is. I'd invite you to please rise for our scripture reading. Our sermon text this afternoon comes from John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This ends our scripture reading. You may be seated. 
And so what does a text like that have anything to do with the goodness of God? Yet if you stop and listen to it, I don't think there is a text in all of Scripture that fuller describes the goodness of God. Because think about it. If I was to say to you, all right, come up with a random verse in Scripture if you can. Come up with some random verse about how good God is. You could probably think of some. But the reality is those verses might just identify one of the aspects of God's goodness. But hear the first part of this. After this, Jesus knowing that all was finished. All was finished. What was finished? God's plan. From the beginning of time to reconcile the world to himself through Jesus. That verse right there is the whole of Scripture. All of Scripture is God's plan of redemption for mankind. All of it happening right there. All was now finished. That's how good God is. Is that his plan from the beginning was to save us. To receive from him this undeserved grace that only he could give to us. So let's spend some time then today understanding all the great attributes and characteristics of God. Let's look at the whole of scripture to see how good God is. The first thing I, have, I think we have to do if we're going to talk about a great God is we have to just look at creation. This morning, Kyle Hooper and I got up early. We went and we went on to Sugarloaf and got there about 20 minutes after the sunrise. But like that matters, okay, you're looking around and everything is so beautiful. And you've all been up to Sugarloaf at some point in time and you see the beauty around you and it's great. But to describe beauty like that, you can't even do it. So what I did, and, and you won't notice the beauty in the production work, I apologize for that. But I just, in order to show God's goodness and his creation, I, I put together some little just slideshow video of just some random stock photos I found of nature. It's about two minutes. I just like for you to just watch this. But as you watch it, don't just look at some pictures of nature. Realize that this is the hand of a good creator who made a creation that he called good and he made it for us to enjoy. Jacob, go ahead. Did you notice something in those pictures? All the color? Why did God create color? Why couldn't everything just been of just gray? Wouldn't that have been easy to do? I mean, wouldn't that have been good enough for us? But there's so much color in the world that we can enjoy it in his creation. And what about the music that you heard? Why did God create music, give people like Tchaikovsky the ability to create something with a Nutcracker Suite? Why not just make the whole world function on a dull humming sound? 
because music has emotion and it can connect us to God. Stop and think about like your favorite foods. Have you ever eaten something? And I get that I'm a foodie. This happens to me a lot. But have you ever eaten something where like your taste buds are just singing and dancing in your mouth and you're like, this is just a party going on in my mouth right now. Why didn't God just make food just a bland, flavorless blob of nutrition for us to consume? Scripture says, taste that the Lord is good. He uses meals as this experience for community together. Last night we celebrated communion, Christ breaking bread with his disciples. It talks about at the end then, we will celebrate with God in eternity with this great banquet. See, we, can, we should just be able to look around at creation and see how great God is. And then now let's look even more past creation. So you've got this initial creation that our creator makes, and then it goes on to say, next, God created you. Every single person sitting here right now was created for a purpose. We all have those days we look in the mirror. Some days we maybe we like to flex and go, all right, yeah, I've been working out. We all have those days that we don't like what we see. I'm not good enough, I'm inferior, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed. When those moments happen, do you ever stop and say to yourself, God made me for a purpose? On those days when we just feel down and inadequate and I don't have any value or purpose or meaning, I want you to think of these because I just jotted down random descriptors from Scripture about how God made you and cares for you. Do you know that you were made in the image of God? It says you are God's workmanship. You are the work of his hand. You were knitted together in your mother's womb. And by the way, before you were knitted together in your mother's womb, God said he knew you. He described you as being fearfully and wonderfully made. It says that the very breath you breathe, the very life you have was given to you by the breath of God. God knows every hair on your head, every breath that you will take. He calls you his children. It says he first loved you. And the best part about God in his creation of you and his knowing you is that he assures you that nothing can separate you from his love. So let's explore that now. That nothing can separate you from God's love. Because you got to understand, when God says that nothing can separate, separate you from his love, he means that. Because in all of his goodness, he has promised to never leave you and never forsake you. And, and that in itself is this wonderful promise. To know that you always have a God who is near to you, who will never leave you. That when you draw near to him, he draws near to you. But listen to how really in-depth scripture gets in this. And I want you to listen to this, and as you hear this, this writing from David in Psalm 139, I want you to hear all the descriptors in there to realize that this is the God of the universe and how he is there for you always. Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. 
Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as of yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than sand. I awake, and I am still with you. God formed you. God knows you. He made you. He knows everything about you. He is always with you. But then there's this part of why we're here today, why there's Good Friday. Here we are in light of all of God's goodness, all that he's done for us, how he's created us and these plans he has for us. He loves us and always with us for some reason. We, his creation, have rejected him. And we have sinned against him. It all started when Adam and Eve decided, you know what, this great God that we've been talking about so far wasn't enough. There's got to be more out there and I need it. Clearly, we are entitled to this. So we turn our back in God to go, see, to go seek more. And that sin that happened has permeated mankind and has affected all of our lives every day. And it brought a consequence of death into the world. Here's what Scripture teaches us about sin. First off, sin is against God and God alone. This isn't to say that you can't sin against other people. But what it means is Jesus said that the law is all summed up in our loving God with all our heart and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So when we sin against God or we sin against our neighbor, it all points back to the fact we are sinning against God's law. And why do we sin? James writes in his epistle, because we're lured by our own desires. Our desires, which should be about reflecting the goodness of God in whose image we were created, instead of saying, what would God want? We say, I want what I want. And then that sin that we act upon becomes an instrument for unrighteousness. We talked about that in our Bible study on Wednesday a few months back. I mean, how intense does that sound? Like, we like to think when we do good things, we're building up for good things. That's what good things do. But do you ever realize your bad things have equal type of reactions? We are an instrument for unrighteousness in that. And why do we do all this? Because unfortunately, as Scripture says, there is none righteous, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God, no one does good. So therein lies the problem. You've got this amazing God, not only amazing just in the fact of how big and grand he is that he is the God of the universe who speaks all things into creation, but he created us to be his people. All these things that he has done for us, all the ways that he has shown us how he loves us and what kind of gratitude do we show him? No one seeks God. And so what does God do? He sends his son down to this earth that he could teach us, bring us back to God. And what do we do? We reject him and we hang him up on a cross. And if you think about it, and this is the craziest part about all of it, we hadn't even begun yet to see the full goodness of God until Christ was placed on that cross. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It does not say there, once we earned it, then God gave it to us. Can you imagine what that would try to look like with how big and great God is? And everything we've talked about, all of his goodness, how in the world would we be able to make ourselves good enough that God could ever love us? I mean, seriously, what would you do if God were to say, if you want my love, you're going to have to earn it? What are you going to do? Practice a tap dance routine for him, bring him some flowers? I mean, what could you do? In light of how big he really is, absolutely nothing. We can offer him nothing at all but what does it say again? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is God's doing. To have his son die on the cross for us because he is good. Not because we are good, but because he is good. And this is the part that I think is the real kicker. And I feel like an infomercial. There's this, and now wait for this, and now wait for this. And, but this is the real kicker of all of that, because there is, there's more to that. As if we're already not awed by how good God is to us in creation, and that he has created us, and the plans he has for us, and how he always with us, and how he blesses us, and how he has died for us, we get this. 
Jesus willingly died for us. It'd be one thing if Jesus would have come and died for us on the cross because he had to, and all right, I guess that's what I got to do for these people, right? I mean, that would still be great and all because it saved us, but instead we get this. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That makes us all the much more incredible that he would willingly do this for us, that he found delight in knowing what this was going to accomplish, that he was fulfilling the plan of the Father, which from the very beginning of time was to redeem mankind to himself. Jesus teaches in John 10, starting at chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Going on to verse 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus willingly does this for us. Jesus found joy in doing this for us. All because this fulfilled all that Scripture was about everything building up to this point. And so just like in our sermon text, when you had heard this, that all was completed. All was now finished. The book of Hebrews, which is such an immensely rich book in explaining kind of the why about Christianity, why all this had to happen, why all this stuff did. And you go to Hebrews chapter 10. And we had heard this in our epistle reading, right? That it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We talked about this last night in the Monday Thursday service, that, that because we keep on sinning, there can never be these sacrifices that will continually cover it. So what happens then in verse 5 through 7 again? Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. The sacrificial system had kind of served its purpose, but in all reality, God didn't want us to be continually offering sacrifices. He wanted us to stop sinning. But we couldn't do that, so we had to keep offering sacrifices. So then all things being created through Christ and in Christ for Christ, for the fact that he could then come to die and save us from our sins. That was the sacrifice that was needed to be paid once and for all. Past, present, future sins are gone. And Jesus said, I have come to do your will, and that was the will he came to do. His willingness to die on the cross on our behalf. And thus Hebrews 10.10 10 goes on to say, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's why this is Good Friday. It's been done once and for all. And it's because of that, no more beautiful words have ever been spoken than the words, it is finished. All of Scripture was pointing to that. All of Scripture was fulfilled in that moment. It is finished. By your heads, be a word of prayer, please. Father, we have no words to ever describe what it means for us. But you don't need words from us, Father, just saying thank you and realizing how great you are. Instead, Father, what you would ask are hearts that would just love you, profoundly realizing how good you are. Hearts filled with a delight and a joy in being able to praise you, to serve you, to thank you, to live for you. Grateful for what you have done for us through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. We'll sing our last song together, You Are My King, and then at the conclusion of the song, you're free to leave whenever you choose to.
Joy to all.